Uh, welcome everyone to the fall meeting. Uh, this is by far the largest registration that we've had. Uh, we had to shut down registration on Friday, but uh, it didn't stop the flow of people, so welcome and keep coming. I think it's gonna be a good meeting. I'll do my best to describe how uh, we can make the best of the time we're investing here. Uh, we're calling this meeting uh, by the theme, Building an Industry Part Two, Navigating the Integrated Photonics Technology Transition. The last meeting that we had in June was part one, uh, which was focusing on uh, the supply chain alignment. Uh, in doing so, we found that uh, there's uh, adequate number of competitors along the supply chain, all willing to respond uh, to uh, uh, building the integrated photonics industry. Uh, and what we're looking at today is, uh, what is the uh, kinetic energy associated with that response? And uh, how can we assist it to move faster? So we took a look uh, from a historical view at technology transitions and there's a famous paper that was written by Winston that looked at the sequence of uh, events that goes into technology adoption. He particularly looked into the communications industry starting with uh, radio, which came from a supply of radar engineers after the war, and eventually went to television and then to the internet and, and who knows where it's going now. Uh, and he found that uh, there are basically seven steps. We're gonna cover the first four at this meeting. Uh, a, uh, an embedded competency. So in the case of radio, you have those radar engineers. In the case of integrated photonics, we've got a, uh, uh, a workforce in the US of 10,000 people engaged in the photonic components industry and a workforce of 250,000 people engaged in the electronics IC industry. So the embedded competence is there. The question is how soon will it get focused on uh, integrated photonics, and I'll say a few words about that in these slides. Uh, next, there needs to be a vision of where we want to go. Uh, then prototypes, there have to be a, a, uh, a way to make prototypes and a way to overcome the roadblocks uh, to uh, that uh, establishing that prototyping platform. And then need to be applications that are gonna then take those prototypes and turn them into commercial value. Uh, what we're not covering today uh, and we'll probably cover at the next meeting is, what is that commercial value? Uh, what about the suppression so the incumbent will fight back? And, and uh, there'll be all sorts of reasons why we shouldn't do things differently than we used to. I'll discuss a few of those. And then finally, we get to manufacturing and cross-market platforms. So uh, the roadmap in the past has looked at this and uh, uh, it's found four points that are relevant uh, to what we're gonna be doing this next uh, couple of days. The silicon learning curve carries huge leverage going forward. So there's always a supply of solutions uh, necessary to solve the problems that are being defined by the roadmap. Uh, system function now has an emphasis over devices. So it's no longer an idea of designing uh, at the device or even at the chip level, but uh, you optimize at the system level. Everything gets better with integration. Uh, as we drive more and more functionality into these systems, we can't be taking more volume, uh, and we can't be taking more energy, and we can't be taking more space. And integration is the unique solution uh, to that problem. And lastly, manufacturing is the key silicon advantage. So photonics on the silicon platform carries with it this huge leverage of a manufacturing infrastructure. So if we look at the big picture, uh, the information age, which uh, uh, we have been embedded in, is now becoming the knowledge age. Uh, we're talking about a technology transition not only in hardware, but a transition to distributed systems that gather and process information and then actuate responses. So we'll have a talk today on LiDAR, for instance, which will look at one of the early high volume applications for that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of uh, system. So let's look at the learning curve and where it stands today and why uh, photonics is considered to be important. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, a plot that actually came out of The Economist magazine of all places. Uh, and it's looking at the evolution of silicon technology over time 
and uh, whether it's going to be able to continue on the uh, same learning curve that it had. Uh, many of us think about it in terms of dimensional shrink, and when we get smaller than an atom or smaller than an electron or smaller than a muon, some, somewhere it's going to stop in dimensional shrink. But it actually has already stopped. If you look at the uh, thermal design for power, we can't dissipate any more power in a chip. If you look at the clock frequency, we can't turn up the clock frequency anymore because of the amount of uh, power dissipated by running at high frequencies. And lastly, we're still able to do dimensional shrink, but uh, at seven nanometers, even that is coming to an end. But it's not coming to an end because we're getting smaller and smaller. It's coming to an end because of this plot. This is time, and this is number of transistors you can buy uh, with a dollar. And that started turning over uh, around 2011. And so the goal is no longer to pile transistors into a, in a, into a chip because it's not giving us uh, uh, commercial value any longer. If we look here, this is the number of photonic devices on a chip today. 10,000 is about uh, uh, the highest that I've seen reported today. So if we're going to get from here to here, which we're not going to, uh, but you have to ask, uh, is it a 45-year process to work this integration scheme, or is there a, uh, another path that we should take? And the big question there is, can distributed systems scale cost and performance with photonic integration? And what that means is photonic integration with this infrastructure of uh, electronic ICs. So that learning curve, if you look at it, uh, uh, for students of learning curves, is a log-log plot of cost reduction or uh, uh, number of flops, whatever quality you want to give your system versus time or versus cumulative production. So a learning curve typically is plotted against cumulative production because that's where the learning comes in. Moore's law is a funny little thing because you get an exponential growth in cumulative production and an exponential growth in the amount of applications that are going on over time. So those two come together so that you can substitute uh, time for cumulative production. But let's think about uh, where, uh, what the, the learning curve consists of. It really shouldn't be log-log if it's, if it's a real learning curve. What that means is you apply what you did tomorrow to what you learned today. It should be an exponential curve. Things should continue to get better. But they stop getting better when that particular path of learning uh, reaches its asymptote and we can no longer squeeze any more value out of it and then it turns over so we call that an S-curve. It starts up and then it turns over at the top and it's an S-curve. And if you look at 45 years of a learning curve, that's built on thousands of S-curve innovations that provide solutions all along the way. So the question is where are we going to be getting those thousands of innovations that are going to be required in order for integrated photonics to join the uh, integrated silicon learning curve. Well, here are the reasons why that doesn't happen. One is risk. Uh, large corporations, as well as individuals like uh, uh, you and me, uh, are presented with risk. Uh, your career has been successful doing what you did before. This is a change. Uh, can you navigate that change? And even if you're successful as an individual, uh, what if the industry isn't successful? Where are you going to go from there? So that's the personal risk. And in the same way, a large company might be looking at that saying, here's a new technology. It's going to affect my bottom line while I'm investing in it. Uh, can I afford to invest now? Should I wait till later? Uh, when should I jump on the learning curve for my corporation? And that turns out to be one of the most important decisions that a corporation can make. What are you going to outsource? Are you going to outsource your, the intellectual value that's going to go into building this technology early and hope to buy it back later? Or are you going to be in from the beginning and learn what the problems are and try to develop the solutions to those problems? Lastly, acceptance of the incumbent solution. Uh, metal wires are there. They're easy to connect. Uh, we know how to do it. We sort of know what we're going to do next. Yes, it's getting harder. Yes, the dielectric uh, isolation is getting more difficult and more expensive. But it's there, and it's, uh, 
we think it's reliable, even though it's not as reliable as it used to, and we know it's self-limited as far as its ability to carry bandwidth at the density that we want. Uh, but it's there, and, and that incumbent is always accepted over, over the new solution. And lastly, cost. Anything new is going to cost more uh, until it gets on the uh, learning curve ramp. And the standardization required for that is something that's slow to come in because everybody thinks they have the secret sauce and the unique answer. And uh, the ability to share that answer and build a platform where uh, you can compete on your ability to manufacture rather than your ability to provide a customized solution is a major barrier. So when we organized this meeting, we decided it's time not only to consider technology, but also to consider the infrastructure of the workforce with that. So uh, AIM Photonics Academy is the part of AIM uh, Photonics that addresses that. Uh, Education, Workforce, and Roadmap Foundation for that technology transition. And you'll see some of those uh, uh, activities woven in to this program that we have today. And you can consider uh, whether they're providing value and give feedback as to how they might better do that. So this is the program. Uh, technical program for the next two days uh, with the AIM Academy woven into it. And then on November 2nd, uh, we'll do a rerun of something we just did a couple of weeks ago at Frontiers and Optics in Rochester, uh, looking at the local supply chain and how local companies can get engaged, uh, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises in integrated photonics industry. Uh, and then a meeting in the afternoon of the AIM Academy Advisory Council uh, which uh, looks at its effectiveness. There's lots of food, lots of uh, receptions for networking, uh, and their ability to sign up for AIM Academy briefings at your company, uh, to uh, be able to participate in uh, using their curricula and in the cohort building process. So all of these things, this is the opportunity to take a jump and, uh, and see whether they can benefit you or not. So lastly, uh, what is success track criteria for this meeting. Uh, this meeting is looking at the technology transition to integrated photonic systems. We've got here all of the key manufacturers, the key researchers, educators, and workforce specialists, whether they're speaking or whether they're in the audience. Uh, there's plenty of opportunity for us to talk among ourselves. So the elements of success are just to do that, engage in discussions and workshops, uh, develop the integrated photonic system roadmap supply chain vision, in the, uh, in the breakouts and uh, prepare for your future contributions to the learning curve for integrated photonics. Thank you.